Welcome to Paradise in the Pines, a podcast about the people, places, and stories that make this the home of American golf. Brought to you by the Pinehurst Southern Pines Aberdeen Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. Hello again, everybody. I'm Phil Wurz, President and CEO of the Pinehurst Southern Pines Aberdeen Area Convention and Visitors Bureau, and welcome to Paradise in the Pines. We have gone remote. We are in downtown Raleigh at the Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina, specifically at Visit North Carolina, joined by the executive director of that awesome organization. We're going to talk tourism today with Whit Tuttle. Whit, welcome to Paradise in the Pines. Thanks for letting us into your house. Sure. You know, we're still in the pines here in Raleigh, just not as much <laughs> down that beautiful place where you are, but thanks for coming. Well, man, you've done a tremendous job. You've been executive director, I guess, going on almost 10 years now. Uh, yeah. Numbers just came out from the state of North Carolina. The governor announced a couple months ago, record-breaking year for 2022. Talk about that. Yeah, we're really thrilled. So $33 billion in visitor spending for the state of North Carolina. That's a record. It's 15% increase over the year before. So really glad that that provides more than 200,000 jobs for people in North Carolina and the spending that helps us uh, not have to right. pay more taxes. So uh, really great year. And it was really spread out around the state really well, too, which is important for us. You know, it's interesting when we had a record year in visitor spending $673 million in Moore County, the Pinehurst area, um, you know, but I'm quick to be reminded that, you know, while it's great marketing by the CVB, you know, it's all the things that blend into it, whether it be Pinehurst Resort, the great restaurants, the ability of people to get out into a rural county and escape and, and get away from the bigger city. So what do you attribute that success to? Obviously, the great job you and your team do, but you talked about all 100 counties doing really well. What makes that happen? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a million little things. So it's really interesting in this industry and I came up through the PR world, and you're always mm. trying to take credit for certain things. <laughs> right. and, and we would find, like, say we try and get the New York Times to do a story on us. We would go there and talk to them, and, uh, and maybe they would do a story. Well, then you would find out that that same reporter, you know, maybe Pinehurst had come up and talked to him, and maybe the Outer Banks had come up and talked mm. to him, and maybe the guy had a college roommate who, you know, is living in Raleigh now who loves yeah. it. And so there's a million factors that get that story made, and it's really about the partnership. It's what every one of us does. You know, it's what you're doing in Pinehurst to help people mm. come. It's what the golf industry is doing to get people back out and to realize, hey, this is a nice, healthy thing that you can do that's outdoors, and it's relaxing. And, hey, if you forgot, it's fun. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think it really is. It's a partnership of all of us working together to get that. And it's not just us. It's the government. It's the people of the state. One of the things we, we hear about whenever we talk to people about North Carolina is how nice people are in North Carolina mm. and the hospitality here. You know, and that's something that's, that's, that's just born into us. What we hear as well down in Piners, too, it's not just those things, but it's also the personalities. People remember Chef Warren. They remember, you know, Mark Elliott. They remember the people that run the bed and breakfasts or somebody at the resort, the concierge. They remember the people. So it's not just – it's the personalities and the people that help drive that. They kind of do our jobs for us, too. Oh, exactly. You know, the, the, that's what makes the place so special. It's a, we're a bunch of storytellers, you know, right. and, and there are great stories here and really unique individuals and so much diversity across the state. You know, it's not just all this one type of people, all that one type of people. You, you get a little bit of everything and some great characters. You know, talk about stories. I guess probably the most daunting one in all of our careers was was the pandemic and COVID. I mean, you know, in retrospect, COVID is probably the best thing that ever happened to the game of golf, not just in Piners, but globally. Uh, and for Piners specifically, we're in a rural county, people could socially distance. But I mean, if it's just, you know, to this day, I mean, it's a record-breaking golf uh, demand uh, at Piners Resort and throughout the entire destination. Talk about when that first hit on, and you, everybody remembers St. Patrick's Day 2020, March 17th, oh uh, you know, did you just like jaw drop and like, you know, what the heck's going to happen to our industry? Yeah, it's crazy. You know, I've been in tourism for 30 years and uh, I come from Florida, so I, I've dealt with all types of crisis, you know, hurricanes, hurricanes yeah. shark attacks, <laughs> wildfires, you know, uh, shipwrecks, all kinds of the craziest things you would ever think of. So right. I thought, you know, hey, I, I've dealt with just about every crisis and I know how to deal with them. Something like this came up and it was just was unthinkable, you know. It was like something you see in a in a in a movie, mm -hmm. uh, but it was reality, you know. And and it was like one shoe dropping after the other, you know. And when the the parks in Orlando and Disney shut down, it was like, whoa, this yeah. is serious. And then the major league sports shutting down, you were like, uh, we don't have a plan for this. Yeah. 
<clears throat> we've never had a plan for this. Mm-hmm. Nothing like this is, has ever happened, and nobody expected it to happen. I mean, maybe some people did, but we in the tourism industry certainly didn't. And it, it and how do you how do you market around it? Fight around it? You right. Can't. Yeah. You can't. It was just a, it was an unfixable problem. But you can, and you did with uh, <laughs> you know the campaign that you did. Count on me and see. Talk about that concept, how it was created, and the success of it, because, I mean, all 100 counties got involved, including ours. Yeah, so we were fortunate. You know, I think we had a state that managed the pandemic very well because uh, we focused on safety, but we didn't go overboard. You know, we were like, okay, how can we continue to function but do it in a safe way? And so it was this priority. The priority was safety, but the priority was also to help, you know, keep people uh, moving, keep businesses happening, keep, keep people, keep the economy going. Mm-hmm. So we really had a nice balance between the two. And part of that was uh, the legislature was really quick to come to us and say, hey, look, you guys are marketers. Uh, can you do something to, to encourage people to do this in a safe way, to do the things they want to do and that mm-hmm. they're probably going to do anyway, one way or the other? But can you get them to do it in a safe way? So we were fortunate. We got the funding. Uh, we were able to do partnerships with with uh, communities across the state to focus on safe ways to travel during the pandemic. And so that became this Count on Me NC program, which was really all about traveling safely and, and, and spending money, getting out, helping those businesses, but doing it the right way. Uh, and then let's talk about some more positive news that you kind of get out of the pandemic. Uh, great campaign, the first at last campaign, uh, really shining a light on when people come to North Carolina, what can they experience? Talk about the success of that coming out of the pandemic, the really first non-pandemic uh, campaign that you guys came up with. Yeah, so it was really, it was you know, we took gradual steps. So we count on MNC was really about safety. That was the focus there. Then, then when we saw that, you know, there were some solutions coming up and Things were easing and, and people could travel safely and we had, a, you know, a, a ways to treat the, pan, the virus. Uh, we, we actually started with a, a thing called Drive Through Vacations, which was a really quick campaign that was the idea was, okay, even if you're stay not that comfortable, car. yeah, you, yeah. Can, you can just stay in your car and just drive by these places and they're really cool and mm-hmm. then, you know, get something to eat and, and still go out there. And then we came back with Get Back to a Better Place, which was our first real campaign coming out of the uh, pandemic. And the idea there was... We had all been sort of hibernating. Uh, you know, we'd been stuck in our homes and, and not being able to do the things we wanted to do. And it was time to break that hibernation and get back to a better place, not just a physical place, mm-hmm. but a mental place too, you know, to get back to that better place of what vacation does right. to you mentally. And so we kind of used the theme of bears and hibernating and people coming out of hibernation and did a nice play on that. That was really, really successful. Then we once we saw that that people we monitored you know people's perceptions on on safety and the ability to travel throughout the pandemic. Once we saw people were back into that, okay, I'm ready to go. It's it's time. <laughs> then we got back to the to the uh, to the uh, first at last campaign, which uh, was an award winner for us before that. And, and you guys, so many. I mean, I wouldn't say I forgot about those, but yeah, I mean, uh, there's you guys so roll out so many great creative campaigns, and, and it's so cool because North Carolina is such a beautiful state. Because you know, from Murphy to Manio, it was, what 10, 12 hours to drive from one end to the other. You've got mountains, coast. You've got the sand hills and everything in between. So it's like, what a great state. But one thing that I personally, and I'm sure everybody that runs the CVB and, and looks to visit NC for your guidance and inspiration is that you do it with a budget that is like, ext- compared to your neighbors in Virginia and South Carolina, what you're able to do is is almost miraculous, to be honest with you, because you don't get the funding as much as you would like from the state, but yet your neighbors have four or five times as much money. How, yeah. how much of a challenge is that? That's a big challenge for us. You know, we're, we're about 38th when it comes to states and, and spending. We're sixth in, in visitation, so we're punching above our yeah. weight for sure. And, and what we've seen is even the states like Tennessee and West Virginia have doubled or tripled their tourism budgets in the last couple of years. So they've all got twice the, the amount of dollars to spend that we do. And, you know, most of our big attractions here are, are parks. They're federal or state they're nonprofits. They don't budget. They don't advertise. So we don't have that private industry right. support that a lot of these other states have as well. Uh, so it's a challenge for us. We have to be creative. We have to be really smart, and we have to be partners. And uh, and we have great uh, local tourism offices across the state. People like you that are willing to work with us. And so what we do is instead of dividing up 
uh, to, to promote, we, a lot of times we'll join together. And that, that I think has been the key to our success is that people are willing to jump in together and get that North Carolina message out, realizing that the traveler is going to, going to, they're going to visit different parts of our state. And we're so diverse. We don't really compete. You know, you guys are so different than, than the coast or the mountains. Yeah. Um, so it's a nice mix that people can enjoy a little bit of everything. As we record this, uh, we're a week away from the 2023 U.S. Open in Los Angeles. Uh, the countdown will begin uh, for us uh, in a big way down in Pinehurst and across the state for the 2024 U.S. Open, which will return to Pinehurst, North Carolina, Pinehurst number two, uh, for the first time in 10 years. Um, you've been here through that entire span. You remember the U.S. Open in Pinehurst in 2014. How much has this state and even Pinehurst changed in those 10 years? Oh, I think we've changed a lot. So it's going to be fascinating for people to come and see it. And just what's going on in the golf industry itself, how it's changed and how it's modernizing and how it's accepting new ways and, uh, you know, getting people on and getting people off quicker and uh, people just wanting to be outside now so much more. I think it's a different world. So I'm really excited for us. You know, the U.S. opens a chance just to showcase Pinehurst and it's such a special place. And I think people forget about it. What I love about it is, I think it it can attract a non-golfer too because Mm -hmm. it's such a big event and Pinehurst is such a unique place beyond the course, just hanging out there and showing how much people love it. And what I love is that the players love it too. And when they're interviewed, you know, that comes through. That, yeah. Oh, hey, this is this is a really special place. And this isn't just another U.S. Open. This is a U.S. Open in Pinehurst. Yeah. That's special. And so I can't wait. And, you know, while golf is, we're the home of American golf, I mean, one of our hashtags on our social media is more than just golf. You know, our, our yeah. restaurant team, we're trying to uh, make that one of the best foodie golf destinations in the country. We talked about the personalities, the shopping there. You know, one of the words I hear is timeless because you can oh, look exactly. in the village and you can look at a picture from 125 years ago. It looks almost exactly the same. So uh, it, it is a special place. We're very fortunate to be there. Um, it's Exactly. It's so unique and distinct and authentic. And I think yeah. that's what people love. You go there, and it's Pinehurst. It's not just another place where there's a great golf course. It's Pinehurst, and it feels like Pinehurst. And it, you know, it has that feel, that authenticity. Uh, that people love to have. And you don't get that in many places anymore. Mm, very true. Let's go Let's go back a little bit. You talk about your PR background. Uh, if people don't know, uh, what's, a, what's a Florida Gator, uh, graduated <laughs> from the University of Florida, and then you went to go work in Anchorage, Alaska. I mean, what in the heck made you go from one of the warmest spots in the United States to one of the yeah. coldest spots in the United States and to do it for three years? Yeah, I had never seen snow. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> never seen snow when I flew up there, so... I, you know, it was the late 80s. I was getting out of college, and uh, I was looking for a newspaper job, working in the newspapers, and newspapers weren't hiring very much. So uh, I had three options. I could go to grad school and continue to be poor for another couple of years, <laughs> uh, or I had an offer from the Burlington, uh, Vermont paper, and I had an offer from a former professor of mine up in Anchorage, Alaska. Hmm. And uh, so I looked at the – it was December, and I looked at the temperature in the, in the newspaper, and it was just as cold in Anchorage, Alaska, as it was in Burlington, Vermont. So I thought, well, if I'm going <laughs> to freeze my butt off, I might as well go someplace <laughs> interesting. And so, uh, so I wound up following this professor up to Alaska. He had uh, uh, found a, a buyer for a paper that was dying there, hmm. and uh, he had, the buyer had asked him to be the editor. And so we were going to try and uh, revive a newspaper, and it was really the last great newspaper war. It was a two newspaper city back in the day when, when you know those were going away, and yeah. uh, so it was really it's a fascinating challenge uh, from a work standpoint. It was uh, really interesting, but also just to go live there in a in a place that was completely foreign. No to doubt, me. unbelievable. Yeah. Then then you came back to Florida. I guess you you had enough of the snow. Yeah. Yeah. Came back to Florida, worked uh, at a couple of CVBs, uh, specifically Orange Orange County, Orlando, and then uh, St. Pete Clearwater. Uh, so there had to be some great experiences there. So what uh, what did you learn initially in the, in the PR world and I guess CVB world, tourism world uh, that you still carry with you today? Yeah, I think I think the thing we learned is that you need to be storytellers. You know, everybody wants to tell a story, and you have to show why you're unique, what you're different, what that what that proposition is that that people can't get or, or what's what's special. Uh, and it's hard to find that to zero in. And it can be different for different writers and different people like that, what they perceive as special and what, what they want to do. Um, let's talk about something that's interesting, and especially staying in Florida. Uh, reading, which, and this happened when I was the director of marketing at, at Sandestin Golf and Beach Resort in 
six, seven years ago, Visit Florida was going to go away. I mean, they're still in the news today, like Visit Florida, the legislature there is, is considering, how could you, it doesn't seem fathomable that in a state that relies so much on tourism, wants to remove Visit Florida. Can you elaborate on that or what's going on? Yeah, yeah it's a real challenge, I think, in a lot of places in that there, there are people that think that, uh, you know, government's place is not to, uh, to support industry. Um, or that the industry should support itself. Um, and I think tourism is a bit of a different beast in that most of the local CVBs, uh, you know, they're funded by visitor tax. So mm -hmm. it's not the, the regular tax money that's, that's okay. paying for that. And so I think there's this perception that, you know, uh, the government and the citizens shouldn't help pay for these businesses to bring people here. But I think it's really short-sighted because what it forgets is that you're getting so much more out of that what you do. Our advertising has like a $31 return on investment for every dollar we invest mm -hmm. in advertising to the state. So, so we're not taking money from the citizens of the state. We're really helping them get more money because, as we said, these visitors come, they spend a lot of money, they pay a lot of taxes, and they help our, our communities. They help those restaurants stay open. They mm -hmm. help you get the shopping that you wouldn't have without them. So I think people forget that. But I think, unfortunately, it's this perception that, uh, that it doesn't need it. Uh, but there are examples where it's gone away and it has a devastating impact on the business. So it really is a necessary thing. And I think, I think what happens usually is when those things do go away, like there's an example in Colorado, they took away the state tourism office. Hmm. And within three years, business had, had decreased and revenues were decreasing. And so they immediately put it back. <laughs> um, Gee. Yeah. <laughs> Wonder what happened there. Um, let's, this is interesting. I never talked to you about this, but it's something that's been in the news in North Carolina as far as sports wagering uh, and perhaps casinos. Um, so we understand sports wagering will pass. Uh, and, and it was one vote shy last yeah. year. Uh, there's a casino that was just been built in Danville, Virginia. Um, speaking with somebody with your organization, EDPNC, is that in the budget, there's a potential for some casinos to be built in North Carolina. Um, what impact do you see of sports wagering casinos uh, in North Carolina? Have you guys even explored that, or, or what do you guys think about it? Yeah, I think it'll be interesting. The the there's a couple of different bills. The one I think that really has a chance to pass is this online wagering, sports wagering, which uh, in some ways I think is already being done today. If, if you want to gamble on sports, you, uh, you, you're going to find a way to do it. Um, so I think the advantage of that is it doesn't really change things. People, if they want to gamble on sports, they're going to be able to gamble on sports. This would regulate it a little, would tax it, and would bring some money in. Right. And the nice thing about that, uh, the bill that's out there, is it would create an events fund that would help us hmm get major sporting events, sort yeah. of like a US, more U.S. Opens or golf events, but also could bring in things like a Super Bowl. And, you know, it'd be fantastic to have a Super Bowl in, in, in Charlotte right. uh, or some other, you know, really world-class events here uh, just for the publicity, the, the, the spend, the, the um, spending that comes with them. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the real key to this is if we don't do it, we may lose some of these professional sports franchises that we have. Yeah because it's really a revenue source for them that, that their competitors have that they don't. Uh, and so to me, that's the key there. I mean, I, I love having those professional sports teams, you know, and, and Absolutely. all that here. I think it adds something to the flavor, to the character of the place. I know you're a big baseball guy. There's a AAA yeah. team in Charlotte. I mean, we've got, I think, one of the top probably three or five states in the country that have baseball either single a double a triple a up, up to major leagues so you can't beat the minor league <laughs> baseball experience here in, in north carolina and you know you got things like that charlotte stadium is amazing yeah it's i've not been there i hear it's incredible oh it's beautiful it's beautiful you got the durham bulls yeah. you know yeah and there's nothing more classic than that hit the bull win a stake right everybody's seen that movie it's fantastic yeah. but you've also got things like you know uh, you know, in a five-county stadium, you know, you got these, and, and we've got the summer league, The Mudcats. Yeah, the Mudcats. You, you can go to a stadium that Babe Ruth played in, in Asheville, the Asheville Tourists. Babe Ruth yeah. sat, stood in that Went to many games there, had, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible, it's just the variety and the history here. I love it. Sacred Stadium and, and Fayetteville, the Fayetteville Woodpeckers. We even have a wooden bat league. It's a six-week yeah. co collegiate wooden bat league. Actually, they just had a homestand, scored 19 runs in, two, in, <laughs> in both games uh, over weekend, uh, the Sand Hills Bogies. So, you know, we hope someday – I mean, it, and it was sold out, the, the first game, the first yeah, home yeah. game this past Saturday night uh, as we record this. Uh, but, I mean, 
we envision from a tourism standpoint, we could maybe have a, a legitimate stadium. But where they play right now is at San Luis Community College. But, you know, the Piners area, as much as it's going to grow, and Natalie Hawkins, who's uh, heads up Moore County Economic Development Partnership, says by 2050, we're going to go from 100,000 people in Moore County to 170,000. Um, oh, so yeah. it's it's a hugely growing area. So, um, you know, baseball is is big in North Carolina. We hope it gets bigger in, in the Sand Hills. I tell you what, and I love those summer leagues, the the summer college leagues. Yeah. You know, we've got, we've got the Wilson Tobbs and yeah. Wilson. I went there. That's a stadium, you know, that's that was <laughs> – I think it was a war powers, you know, a, a depression era built stadium. It's just incredible. But you go there – and you feel like it's the 1950s. You know, it's it just takes you back to a place that's it's incredible. It's a great, fun experience. You mentioned the Kinston Indians. I was a news and sportscaster down at WNCT and WITN and in eastern North Carolina from 90 to about 95. And I covered dozens of Kinston Indians games. And so we ha- I'm on the state golf panel as well. And so we had an outing in the eastern part of the state. So I had to come through Kinston. I was like, you know what? I haven't gone by Granger Stadium in years. And I went there. I mean, the neighborhood's kind of changed a little bit, but that stadium is still the same stadium uh they actually i was i was going through town and they had a game that afternoon about three hours but i had to get back to get my dog but it's like man i would love to stay here for for games i've seen so many great games there so manny ramirez played there julian tavares anr diaz they all played for the cleveland indians so you know you see these minor league players and these these smaller a double a teams i mean these are guys you eventually could see in the major leagues but you saw them play in north carolina first oh exactly and the experience you get there you know you get to have you're right next to them Right, yeah. right on the sidelines, you can talk to him. We were down at five points and saw Dansby Swanson when he was oh, uh, wow. you know, just a kid, yeah. and now he's you know one of the best shortstops in baseball. Okay, I, I've had Elizabeth Hudson on this podcast, and, and I'm going to ask you the same question. It, it's a tough question because it's like asking Elizabeth Hudson, you know, what's your favorite re- favorite place <laughs> to eat, or what's your favorite part of the state. So, talk about what what is your maybe top three hidden gems maybe in the state of North Carolina. You don't have to mention Piners because we know it's a special place, but okay. what would be like your three hidden gems? Because I mean, obviously I can't pin you down to like, what's your favorite part of the state, but what sure. is like people got to sure. see if they've never okay. been to NC? Yeah. If you haven't been, I think one of the things I think is so special, I look for the stories that are the most unique and distinct stories. And to me, one of them is Ocracoke Island. So Ocracoke's amazing. You can only get there by ferry. We've got a couple places you can only get to by ferry. But Ocracoke is the place where Blackbeard the pirate was killed. And they know the exact spot in Springer's Point where this, you know, famous person was killed. And, and a lot of people don't even think Blackbeard was a real person. He was, and he was there. It's just Okay, incredible. I got to stop you right there. I did a news report down there when I worked in the eastern part of the state. The legend has it, and this is true, yes, he, he did die there, but I heard that they buried him in the sand at low tide. So they said when the crow cocked, then you would die because the tide would 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 drown him. And say, and he was saying, "Oh, crow cock, oh, crow cock," because and that's how they got the name Okra Cook because Blackbeard wanted to die because he wanted the tide to come in. Mm-hmm. He knew he was going to die. Was is that true? That's what somebody told me when I did the story. Probably not. <laughs> right, okay, <laughs> but it's a great story. it's a great story, isn't it? and and that's the thing with Blackbeards is tremendous stories down there. And if you go down there, the people in Okra Cook still with, speak with a bro oh, yeah. and accent, yeah. you know, which is. Is fascinating to me that they're so isolated out there. And you can go to Portsmouth Island on the other side of Ocracoke, which is a, a ghost town. Everybody left, and the town is still there, but everybody left. They never got mm. power. So um, that's fascinating to me. And then places like Cataloochee Valley in the mountains. Uh, if you haven't been to Cataloochee Valley, it's really interesting. It's on the Smokies. Mm-hmm. It's a great place out there called the Swag where you can stay. But they've reintroduced elk into the valley. Um, mm. which, you know, we lost all our elk yeah. at one point, but they've come back and they've really thrived. So if you go out there and you can camp, you can hang out. But uh, if you've ever heard an elk bugle, it's amazing. It sounds like a whale. Yeah. And they do it in this valley, and so the sound kind of Carries, echoes yeah. across the valley. Yeah, It's like you're in outer space. I mean, it's really – it's beautiful – and bizarre at the same time. Just don't go try and touch them. Like right. the people are no, doing no, no, Yellowstone no, no. with the bison. Yes. What, what's going on with that? I don't get it. Uh, it's like... People are idiots. <laughs> people are just idiots. And one other hidden gem? Uh, let me try and think of a Piedmont hidden gem that I really like. Uh, uh, let me think. So, boy, I tell you what. I, I like the little towns like uh, Danbury. If you've ever been to Danbury, hmm. North Carolina, really neat little town. You can go. You can do rafting. You can do... The- <laughs> this thing is called tubing, but you know how you go tubing down yeah. the river. They do tubbing. 
Huh. Where you're, where you're basically in a big tub. Really? <laughs> and you can go down the river. Yeah. It's <laughs> that great, floats and it doesn't tip over? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. Dansbury. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, so I know a town that you've been to and you enjoy as well is Barbecue, North Carolina. Uh, so uh, what is it about barbecue and Barbecue, North Carolina, or just barbecue in general? Barbecue is special, you know, in, in North Carolina. What I love about barbecue is, is like we said, it's, it's authentic and it's sense to a place. You go to a barbecue and the reason the barbecue tastes the way it does is because of that place, something that's there. Mm-hmm. That's the way it's been done there for so many years. Ah, what I also love about barbecue is that uh, you go to a barbecue restaurant, you will see all kinds of people there. You will see, <laughs> right. you know, day laborers and stock traders and, and uh, you know, and the priest from the local church or the pastor and uh, everybody gets the one. It's just, it just gives you a sense of community. And that's my, my favorite picture of myself and my favorite experience I've ever had in North Carolina is this little place called Barbecue Township. They don't have a barbecue restaurant in the town of Barbecue, <laughs> which is crazy, but right. they have a church, the Barbecue Presbyterian Church, and the church ladies there that we had a special event, and they were cooking barbecue. So I had a barbecue <laughs> sandwich at, in the town of Barbecue at the church of Barbecue. That's about as barbecue as you can get. Well, barbecue is a religion, so it, it only makes sense exactly. that it would be at the church. Talk about you've been to the Piners Barbecue Festival. This will happen again this Labor Day weekend. What did what were your impressions? Of that? It's a new event. Uh, this is going to be the third year. Chris Prieto from Food Network uh, is kind of the guiding force behind that. And uh, so, what, a, what do you what think? A fantastic event. And what I love about that is you can. The trouble with barbecue is to get those differences. You have to travel a lot, you know. Right. And and it's and it's so it's hard to get you know drive three hours and then you get one meal and then well you got to drive another three hours. Well, you just ate a meal. So it's hard to get those different barbecue experiences. That festival you guys do is so fantastic because you get a great variety from across the state. It's not just, oh, these are the local regional guys. This is all across the state. And you can get it, you know, within walking distance of each other. Right. You get a little bit from each one, but it's way more food than you can ever eat. In fact, my son and I were challenging <laughs> ourselves to see if we could finish every single one. You get seven stamps or seven barbecue. I, again, I, I think I did five last year oh. and maybe five the year before, but you're right. I mean, they give you a pretty good helping of, of all that. Oh, they give you a great sample size, and it's just a great way to experience the state. There's beer there. There's there's all kinds of beverages. There's entertainment. It's a perfect experience, and and what you'll learn from there will send you all across the state to uh, to try different barbecue. And before the U.S. Open next year, we're going to have two things down there with that you're going to hear about. One is a destination distillery uh, that is two ex army um, personnel. Uh, one actually, it's called B Hawk Distillery, uh, inspired by Black Hawk helicopter. Also, it means Brad Hawk, uh, Brad Hauling. American Whiskey Company. Uh, Brad was actually on the mission that inspired the movie Black Hawk Down uh, in Mogadishu. Wow. Uh, that facility, I could go on and on about it, but you need to come down and take a tour before they open. And then uh, Micah Neubauer, who owned and founded Southern Pines Brewing Company, has purchased the old Tyson M. Jones buggy factory in Carthage, downtown Carthage. Oh, yeah. And by this time next year, will be a two-story restaurant bar. I'm hoping the building is old. So, you know, the soundness of that structure is, is, is compromised. So Micah's going to do what he can to reinforce it. But I was like, man, you got to have a rooftop bar. So one thing we don't have down there is a rooftop experience. And uh, so that would be a, a great thing but you're going to see that before the, the u.s open next year oh, that'll be a great addition you know and it's amazing to me when i first got here the states really had wineries since yeah. you know the mother vine originally uh and we've done a tremendous job with beer you know we got more craft breweries than any other state in the south and now distilling has really ramped up yeah. and we're people are producing some well, we've got the moonshine stuff. and motors moonshine, moonshine and motorsports, motorsports trail sports. now yeah yeah and it really connects to you know the moonshine story which is also a great story for north carolina and north wilkesboro and thomas sally did an awesome job with everything in north wilkesboro we're on a committee along with gene mclaurin who's uh, your number two guy with edpnc uh, lives down in rockingham and does a great job for economic development and chris chung and the team here at edpnc but we're trying to get a race back at rock at the rock in rockingham which would be an awesome thing new owners they repaved the track new suites that have been uh, constructed so we we're hoping fingers crossed that we can get interest from nascar to uh, to come back uh maybe not for the the big boy race but uh you know a bush series race or yeah. something like that would be would be awesome that track is amazing i went and saw it last year we have to have a race there it needs a race it's a what a what a fantastic track Right now in this year, 2023, it's the year of the trail. Uh, talk about that initiative. I mean, we've in Moore County, we've done several things uh, uh, to support year of the trail. How's it going uh, statewide? Oh, it's 
really super, you know, and it's great, great to see so many people get together. I think it's another thing that's come out of the pandemic yeah. is people want to get outside. Uh, and what a great way to do it is trails. And so we try to emphasize that this isn't just, you know, a, 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 say a walking trail or a bicycle trail. This could be a trail for a food tour. This could be a trail right. for a kayak. Yeah. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of trails across the state, and so many of them people don't even notice. There might be one in your neighborhood that you don't even know about. So the really beauty of this, I think, is it got people thinking about trails and where they are. And so hopefully we can do more and more of that to get people out to experience them. One thing we did in Moore County is the Pinecone Pathways yeah. Program. So we uh, partnered with StarWorks uh, just over the county line in Montgomery County and Star North County. If you've not been to StarWorks, Star an amazing facility. Yeah, you should go. They have a Metalworks now, too. So yeah. that, that's going to grow as well. And they're, they're, they're going to build a mini campus there with housing, I think, for 10 people. So it's going to be a really cool, lively uh, culture and environment there. But uh, we partnered with them. They did 100 glass pine cones that we hit all over 36 trails in Moore County. It absolutely exploded. And But what was cool was we had people say, you know what? I After I get home from work, I usually just veg in front of the TV. Now I go out and walk these trails. I walk 50 miles. I've lost 30 pounds. Uh, but what we wanted to do, because you thought of the year of the trail, uh, we wanted to present you with oh. your own pine cone from the pine cone pathways program these i'm telling you what we've had people say can we buy them it's like no we own the mold so that makes them even more valuable but we did the hundred and we it was so popular like you know what we're going to buy another hundred and we just finished that program memorial day weekend and so people are like i need to go see a psychologist psychologist psychiatrist because i don't know what to do now that i don't i can't look for pine cones uh -oh. the town manager of southern pines i told him uh this was a couple days before the end of the program i said there are two more out there at weymouth woods he literally went home changed his clothes and went looking for those two pine cones uh they found one just about 150 yards from where he would have found it uh and then oh. the second one was found so i so said we may do it again in the fall we're still trying to figure out we're trying to decompress but anyway it was a great program we wanted to present you with your own pine cone well thanks so much that's so special and it's so like we said it's unique and distinct to your area and what a great thing you did there you know so many people ask me who's your biggest competitor is it tennessee is it virginia is it south carolina our biggest competitor is the couch, you know, <laughs> right. because yeah. it's so easy just to go home and just sit or have a day off and say, oh, I'm just going to sit and watch my big TV and hang out and, and not get out and do something. And, and so, you know, getting people motivated to do it, something like the pine cones, it's just an amazing idea and how special that is for somebody. And, you know, like you said, you can change somebody's life by doing that because, they go out to go get that pine cone and they realize, hey, this is nice. And, I, you know, I like going for walks. I go for a walk and then suddenly they've lost 20 pounds and, yeah. you know, they're going to live a couple years longer and, and have a better life. So what a great thing to do. Congratulations. To oh, you guys thank you. That. Yeah, it's, it, we've had some great stories, so many of them, and uh, we look forward to the next thing. Speaking of the next thing, you guys have a campaign called, called For Real NC. Uh, as we get ready to wrap up, talk about that program and uh, what that's going to mean uh, for the state of North Carolina and for your marketing. Yeah, we did. We're really excited about that. So as I said, we're always looking at what people want, what people are expecting. And, and what we saw was that when people came out of the pandemic, they wanted to get back outside, but they also wanted, they didn't want the same old, same old. They wanted something different. They wanted something unique and distinct and authentic. Yeah. They wanted to experience the real things, not the, not the Walmart things, not the, you know, <laughs> not the, what everybody's got. Right. Um, and so we actually came up with this idea, you know, and we're a real state. I mean, we've got so many things that are real and authentic and different and unusual. And we thought, well, this is great. It really feeds to us. It's what we hear about the state of North Carolina. So we're going to show the things that are for real in North Carolina. And whether that's, you know, the only place where Donald Ross lived on the actual <laughs> course he created. Yeah. There's only Dornick one place. Cottage. Yeah. yeah. And there's only one place like that in the world. And yeah. that's the real thing is there. Uh, and so there are hundreds of those examples across the state. And so that's what we wanted to do was kind of highlight all those real authentic experiences you can have. You know, in the midst of this 30 plus minute podcast, we never even mention and congratulate you on earning the State Tourism Director of the Year honor in the United States. You were, yeah. okay, we're, we're just going to go ahead and do the joke. You're the number one STD, the State <laughs> Tourism Director yeah. in the in the yeah, United States. So congratulations for that. Uh, and uh, what does that mean to you? Thanks. Well, yeah, it's an unfortunate acronym. But, <laughs> you know, there are only about 50 people that have these jobs. And so yeah. uh, it's it's really... 
tremendous for them, uh, for the industry to look at me and say, you know, our program was the best of, of any of those. Mm. Uh, it's quite an honor. I never expected to get it. It's, uh, it's a very challenging thing to do with, as you said, we've got a small budget, we've got a small staff, um, but I think it's really, it's the, it highlights the, the great way we work together to, to build up our program beyond what it could be just based on the funding. Uh, but it's really the people, you know, it's uh, my staff, I think is the best in the, in the world. Um, and the partners we have across the state just pitching and pull, and we, we do amazing things. Yeah. So we've been fortunate. Well, we appreciate everything you do. You're an inspiration, you're a friend. Uh, you mentioned your staff. They're phenomenal. I wish we could name them all because they do a phenomenal job to support you and everything you do. We appreciate the creativity. Uh, and again, thanks so much for what you do for the state of North Carolina. Thanks for letting us into uh, your home here at Visit NC and Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina. We look forward to coming back. Sounds great. Well, th back. thank you so much, and we'll get you some barbecue soon and some baseball. <laughs> but uh, if you want to learn more about tourism in the Sand Hills, go to homeofgolf.com. If you want to see this video, go to our YouTube channel, which is Home of American Golf. And if you love podcasts, download, search Paradise in the Pines. I'm Phil Wurz. We'll see you next time. <laughs>